please go ahead sir okay hello and thank you for inviting me uh, my talk is about temple architecture in the samarangana sutradhara uh, a, a famous uh, vastu shastra text text on architecture ascribed or attributed to the illustrious Parmara ruler Bhoja, who ruled from around 1000 to 10, or 1010 to 1055 CE. Another of Bhoja's uh, ambitious projects, other than the Samarangana, is his uh, royal temple at Bhojpur near Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. This is a picture of the site, uh, the unfinished temple in the background, the earthen ramp up which these huge uh, stone pieces like the ones in the foreground here would have been dragged, no doubt, by elephants. There was a big lake um, for irrigation, everything full of ambition. And we need to see this text in that context as part of Bhoja's great cultural pro project to bring together all the branches of knowledge. Various texts are attributed to him. Now out of about uh, 83 chapters in that text, as it has come down to us, um, there are about, I think it's 12, which are directly dealing with the designs of temples. And they look at different kinds of temples. And not only are the temple forms different, but the approach, the approach and the, even the Sanskrit vocabulary, the terminology in these different chapters varies. So it seems clear to me that uh, Bhoja or people in his, um, in his entourage were gathering together uh, texts from different traditions, from different regions, in order to make a, a great compendium. I'm going to be talking about the way the Samarangana deals with Nagara, Dravida, Varata, and Bhumija temples. Very briefly, it, of course, um, but uh, with, in, at a little bit more length uh, with Nagara and Bhumija. And because these texts are, in my opinion, from different sources, it, they are a good illustration of how Vastu texts in general are not all the same. Their approaches are different and some are closer to practice and some are more abstract and theoretical. So starting with Nagara, North Indian traditions, uh, the text seems, texts seem to have been gathered from central India, Malwa, where um, Bhuja's court was, and other parts of central India and western India. There are, there are three or four chapters which deal with Nagara, and they're all slightly different. I'd like to dwell on chapter 56, which, is, which itself has... Uh, pieces in it from different sources. It deals with different forms of, as you would expect, different, different uh, types of North Indian Nagara temple, including the simple Latina with its curved shikara. This one is a, that illustrated here is a type which is given the name of Vardha, Vardha Mana. And bear that in mind because I'll, I will come back to it. But I want to look in, in more detail at one called Kesari, which is very important as ways, uh, as will become clear. Um, and I'll do, go into it in a little bit more detail because it'll give you the idea of the way uh, the de uh, a design is communicated by the text. So this prasada has five un andakas, it's panch andaka, which means that it's got five of the 
amlakas, the crowning amlakas with the kalasha finial on top. So it starts by telling us, having made a square field, it's divided into eight bhagas. Now bhagas are parts. It's all about uh, giving a given length and then subdividing into a given number of bhagas, sometimes called padas, sometimes called, sometimes called amshas. They, they all mean parts. It tells us that the garapa, the abode of the gods, should be in the middle and it's two parts out of the eight. But then it says insert the wall in one bhaga and a karika. Often we have to get the idea of what it's talking about from the context. We can't look up very easily in, in some glossary, what is a karika? Uh, but from the context, we understand it must be the ambulatory. So there's an inner wall of one, an ambulatory around, and the external wall should be one paga. Now, we can see that it's a Sandhara temple, one with an, an internal ambulatory. In the karmas, which are the corners, one should construct ratikas of two bhagas size. And the rest should be a bhadra adorned by udakantaras, which means recesses or water channels. So the, what that means is that the bhadra, which is the rest to, to either end for the karna, that leaves us two for, leaves us four for the bhadra and the recesses have got to come out of that four. Oh, and it's projecting by one bhaga. So it's projecting out one part and this procedure should be applied in all the directions. And notice that um, there's no door, there's no mandapa, because in these texts, the temple is conceived as an ideal, symmetrical, four-sided uh, um, image, of, image of the universe with four axes. So having given us the plan, the tala mana, the measurement of the tala, we move on to the Urdhvamana, the upper measurement, which is the elevation. And it tells us the wall, Janka, the wall, should be four bhagas high, and the Kuraka, which is, means a water pot, but it must mean the base, the Vedibanda, should be half of that. So the wall is four and the base is two. One should construct the Varandi and the Antarapatra as one bhaga. So to get it to look right, I assume that they both fit into one. So that's the kapotali um, and the, the recess above it. Inside that, why well, that doesn't quite make sense, but inside that must mean on top of that, there is a ratika with a height of three pagas. Now, ratika in this, it means, different, means a lot of different things. In this text, from the context, it means the shringa, the little chikara, crowning the pillar, which is the, um, the, the, the conceptual stamba or pillar in the wall. Um, and why do I know that the bhadra, the central projection, is an ud, has an udgama, a, a gavaksha pediment, because it it has, a, has to add up to five andakas. Uh, if I gave it another shringa, an ura shringa, we would have five, six, seven, eight, nine, which would be too many. The shikara should be in six pagas, which works with the way it lines up below in, the, in its base and elevated for whatever's left over for the given height, which somehow they didn't give us. Having divided its height into three, one should draw a venu kosha, which uh, knowing how these things usually are, it must mean that the radius of curvature of the shikara is three times the width. One should divide the shoulder sheath 
skandha kosha, kosha into four parts. So we divide, divide the shoulder, the skandha, into four. And on the basis of those new bhagas, we should build a padma, shirsha, and a griva in one amsha and a half. Amsha is seen as bhaga, a part, and it must be these new, new kinds of parts, and one and a half it would look better if we made them both add up to one and a half, so three quarters, three quarters. One should build the kumha and the amala saraka in one bhaga each. So the kumha, which is in this context, is the, uh, the amlaka, uh, and the, the kumbha, um, um, amla, no, the kumbha, sorry, the kumbha is the pot on top, the amla saraka is the amlaka, and above that one should construct the bija puraka, which is the little finial on top, in half a bhaga. So this is the Kesari temple, and we see it has one, two, three, four, by Andakas. We can find quite a lot of examples of this form of temple, not necessarily following exactly the same proportions, because rarely do we find temples exactly following the text, uh, but in its, in its design we find many examples. Uh, this one is at Dedadara in Gujarat. There's another common, common type which becomes um, prevalent in the, around the, the 10th century, which is like a downward proliferation of that Kesari type. Uh, one more story and four more Kutas Tambas on the corner, so another, an extra tier. And in chapter 56 of the Samarangana, that type appears uh, under the name of Sarvato Bhadra, beautiful on all sides. And why did I said that Kesari was important? It's important because it's the first of um, 25, a series of 25 temples. The 25 temples starting with Kesari ending in Meru is a series of temples, of Nagara temples, that appears in a number of texts and, um, and it evolves with the times. Uh, the, the just, um, it doesn't, it, it's not all, all, all these texts aren't the same, but they have this idea of 25, starting with Kesari, which has five Andakas, and ending with Meru, which has 101. Uh, and so the game is that with each successive type, you have to have four more andakas. So that's a clue when you're trying to figure out the designs of the text. To my mind, this text probably date is probably earlier than the 11th century date of the Samarangana, because the architecture, the, the architectural approach is very much the kind of thing you find in Central and Western India during the 10th century, where they're playing these games of combining different forms of already composite Anyakandaka temple in, to create new forms. So this temple here, the Ambika temple at Jagat in Rajasthan, has one of our Kesari temples at the center of a more complicated design. And a temple like you see on the right, the Lakshmana temple at Kajaral, combines three, at least three different already composite temple forms. Uh, the one over on the left, the one we are called the, that our text calls the Kesari, is the top of the one it calls Sarvato Bhadra below. It's also the middle of one like we've seen at, at uh, Jagat. And the whole of that becomes the top 
of the Lakshmana, which has a Sarvatovadra in the middle and a Kesari on the top. So an ingenious uh, combination of all these temple forms. And that approach is, is very much evident in that series in chapter 56 of the Samarangana. So just to take a couple of examples, this one, it tells us that it's got a Sarvato Bhadra in the middle. And with this one, it tells us, take the previous one and add a Vardhamana in the middle, which if you remember was that first Latina temple that I showed you. Uh, it tells you put one of them in the middle. So it's using the word Vardhamana to mean a simple Latina. And we put that at the center. So the, these kinds of in ingenious game are going on before uh, the real sort of sequential unfurling and burgeoning of the Shakeri temple form that takes place that begins in the 10th century and then carries on through the 11th and into the 12th. One form successively bodying out, emerging and expanding out of the, an earlier simpler form. Another version of the Kesari series, the 25 temples starting with Kesari, is in the Aparajita Pricha, 12th century Western Indian text, which I'm not talking about today, but I'm just, I'll just show you the, the, my drawings of the designs out of that text, which are much closer to the complexity that we find in the actual built tradition in the 11th and 12th centuries. So going back to the Samarangana, there's another chapter, chapter 57, also dealing with Nagara temples, which if you look at the drawing, which is something like the design of the uh, Vishvanatha temple at Kajarao on the right. Um, that if, you, if you, you can see in the drawing, there's very much more detail because in these drawing, drawings, I'm just trying to show what is in the text, not, to, not adding details and um, not elaborating. But um, my, the, and then and it's an interesting design with this very big internal space, which um, I've never found in an actual temple. Despite all this extra detail, the, the text is only ever a framework, which is a starting point, a skeleton into which the, the architect and the artisans have to, uh, give, to put the flesh and bring out the detail and improvise and invent so that no two temples, even if following a text, can do it in, in a strict and rigid way. They, they will always be different. Briefly, I'd like to go back to chapter 56, because after that case reset series, they, there's, um, there are a few interesting designs which show how texts can invent things uh, which invent temple designs, uh, which may be never built. And if we did try to build them, it would be a challenge and you, the result would be something that might never have otherwise have been dreamt of. Texts, of course, take account of the tradition that's already established particular types, but they can also look ahead when we have a, a sort of logic of sequence like we've just been looking at, they can take that logic forward and envisage types which have not yet been built and which may in future be built. But this one, I don't think it's ever been built. It's a, 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 a great uh, tour de force of imagination called the Navatmaka. They tell you to uh, put a sanctum in the middle. And then it says, 
I think the the overall uh, I'm not going to count the squares, but it's whatever it is, probably um, a, a square divided into say 19 or something. And then it says take the corner is six, and then redivide that into 10. And then it goes through some instructions to create a little temple on the corner based on that subdivision into 10. And then it gives you the upper measurement, the Urdhvamana, the elevation of those corner temples. And it doesn't tell you, but later on it will refer to Sarvato Bhadras on the corner, uh, sorry, yeah, Sarvato Bhadras on the corner. So this one we're already familiar with from the text. Uh, we've got one of those on each corner. Then it goes to the middle and the Bhadra is like that. And very unusually, it has this big space, internal space, and a little um, temple which seems to have not to go up to the ceiling, it gives you the height. It seems to be like a little freestanding miniature temple in each Bhadra. Then it goes to the elevation of the Bhadra, which it calls a Valabhi, which means it's got Gavak, uh, barrel vaulted roof, proliferated a Gavaksha pediment in a composite form like this at the center. So there's the Valabhi flanked by its two Sarvato Bhadras. And then this is where it gets really interesting. It tells you to put Sarvato Bhadra temples on top of each other in the middle and the corner. And we, we, because of the width of the top shikara, which is eight, we can see it all fits together exactly. There are three up the corners and three more on top of the Valabhi at the center. So all those temples themselves made up of little temples going in, put together to make one extraordinary temple, which if, it, if, any, if anyone did build it, would be amazing. Let's move on now to Dravida temples in the Samarangana Sutradhara. I'm not going to talk about them for very long, because for South Indian temples, uh, it's much better to look at the South Indian texts. Uh, these, the way, clearly they've gone, or Boja's people went to the South and got some texts. I don't know actually how, how it was transmitted, but the way they look at South Indian temples, clearly based on the South Indian tradition, but they look, they kind of look at it through uh, Central Indian, a Central Indian perspective. So there are lots of quite strange things about it. The, the details, are, they go through details right from the bottom, which is typical of South Indian texts, actually, that the mouldings and little details are uh, enumerated right from the bottom all the way up to the top. Uh, but you can just about figure out the kind of shapes that they would mean, but it, it, it ends up in something pretty weird. With, in a, at a little bit more length, I'll, I'd, I'd like to mention Varata temples. Well, actually, the chapter, chapter, chapter 64, it is, is on, it calls them Vavata. But the more usual term is Varata, Varata. Um, those are my drawings from the instructions. And it's, having looked at the Nagara chapters, I've looked at Dravida, if we look at the Sanskrit terminology, it's kind of veering southwards. Nobody, you know, it's it's not we, it's not an it's not very well known. What are Varata temples? I I think from the way they're dealt with in this text, I believe that they, it is talking about the sort of temple that we find in Dakshina Koshala, that's uh, present day Chhattisgarh state. Um, that we know from the 9th, 8th, 9th, 10th 
centuries, uh, place like, places like uh, Palari, Sirpur, and so on, where you have elements which are more Nagra, elements which are more Dravida. And I think what it is, is that the, it's a tradition that began, has its roots in the Vakataka period, in the Deccan, in architecture like you see at Ajanta, before Nagara and Dravida had crystallized and become differentiated. At Ajanta, we find prototypes of what would later become southern forms, as well as ones which would later become northern forms. And I think, and we can see evidence at places like Mansar, the, the Vakataka, eastern Vakataka capital, uh, that there was a brick tradition which took these kinds of elements, created a temple form which survives. With mo all those ones have uh, disappeared, but they, the, the form survives in Dakshina Kosala. And the texts, uh, if you try to draw from the text, that's the kind of on, the only way I can make sense of it. We see things like, for example, a series of rather southern looking pilasters, series of moldings, and it says you can, you've got the choice between a ghanta, which is in this context, uh, a, a Dravida-like uh, dome, the kuta dome, or an amala saraka, the ribbed, crowning member of the, the Nagara. And there, are, there is a type where it tells you that the, the Kurnas, the, 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 the in-between elements, sorry, the Kurnas uh, should be four Padas, the Pratyangas should be the same, and the Pratyangas, which are the inter intermediate elements, should be made beautifully turning in towards one another. So it gives you a kind of semi-stellate plan such as we see here at the Rama temple in Sirpur. I would like to end the talk by dwelling in a little bit more detail on the treatment of Bhumija temples in the Sambarangana. This is chapter 65 and it stands out for its coherence and its rigor. Perhaps not surprisingly, because it was the Bhumija form that the Parmara dynasty chose as their, uh, as, as, as their preferred one. It spread from Malwa all over the Deccan, also westwards, not, um, but especially south right throughout the the, the Deccan, but the origins do seem to be in Malwa. And I think the, uh, the theory and the practice were being worked out at the same time. It's not like the Nagra traditions we've touched on where it's evolving over a long period and there's a, 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 an evolutionary pattern which goes across centuries. It's a, the Bhumija is a self-conscious invention around the end of the 10th, beginning of the 11th century. And the form itself doesn't lend itself to the kind, the, uh, the sort of um, emanatory proliferation that we find in other, certain other traditions. The four, once invented, the, the base, the underlying types are kind of um, already evident. These types can be orthogonal or square, or they can be stellate or star shaped. The central lata of a Nagara temple remains, and the segments of the shikara are formed by kuta stambas, little shikaras on pillars going up in vertical bands. So they're not inventing it out of nothing, they're, it comes primarily out of the Nagara matrix, but consciously and deliberately 
because of an awareness of southern forms as well as northern forms, they introduce certain elements which are Dravida or South Indian, as seen through Central Indian eyes. Not notably, the what's called the, the Shala, that is the, the Vadra, the central projection of the temple, takes the form of a, a barrel-roofed temple, but not a northern Valabi. It's, a, it's like a, a South Ind Indian Shala, um, but as I say, from a Central Indian perspective. There are many little kutas in it, which are the Central Indian version of a Dravida kuta, which becomes stylized like this. And in fact, in most cases, certainly in Malwa in, and in uh, Maharashtra, the mini shikaras on top of the kuta stampas are not Latina form. They are made up of a whole of chains of these little, what they call Dravida Karma Kutas. Now, chapter 65 of the Samarangana deals with square, stellate, and astabhadra forms. So square orthogonal ones, there are four. There are one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven stellate, and there are five astabhadra or ashtashala temples, which means that it's they've got bhadras on not only on the cardinal axes, but also on the 45 degree axes. So they're star-shaped with eight bhadras. In, in my view, the earliest surviving Bhumija temple or temples are at a, a site called Ashapuri, not far from Bhojpur. And it was from there that the Masons would have been, would have come when Bhoja started his ambitious, giant, enormous royal temple. That temple as it is today, we're looking at it now a little bit closer up, is a great block, square block-like form. There are drawings in, uh, engraved on the rocks and from those drawings and the surviving fragments, which were never built into the temple, we can deduce that it would have been a Bhumija temple, an enormous one, the biggest, temple ever built. So, returning to the text, I'd like to run through two of the, uh, the designs that are given in, in it, and then compare those with the uh, actual built examples. This is one that this, uh, the second, I think it is, of the square uh, Bhumija temples. It, te it tells you, start with a square divided into 10 bhagas. And all, you'll find that all, the, all of them start like that. And it says that the Garbhagriha, the sanctum, is six out of the 10. So that leaves two either side for the walls. So now we'll do the, the projections in the plan, which are taken at the Kura level, that's the hoof of the Vedi Bandha. Uh, so you don't see the recesses in the wall because they come above that level. And to get the size of the different uh, projections in the plan, we don't use the original division by 10, it gives us a new division into 12. And out of that 12, the text tells us that the corner is two, the pr pratirata, the intermediate is one and a half, 
So two, two, one and a half, three, and that leaves us five for the Padra at the center, for the Shala. Then we move on to the uh, elevation. Taking the original 10 bhagas, it gives us 22 for the height, with, and then specifies certain, a certain number of bhagas for all the, for the different divisions of the elevation. So two and a half for the base, four and a half for the wall, and three for the Varandika and Kuta of the first Bhumi, or first tier. So there we have the, 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 the complete Kuta stampers of the first Bhumi with the, uh, the, the, the central shala up to its neck. Then for the remaining parts, We've got 12 left of the original 10 bhagas, but we redivide that into 19 and a half. Seems like a very strange number, doesn't it? But, and we get these uh, interesting numbers. And the reason those are there is that the, uh, the, the diminishing bhumis as they move up all follow the same principle, which is that for each successive bhumi, you take off one quarter of a bhaga. So five is for the first, then take off the quarter is four and three quarters, then four and a half, then four and a quarter, leaving one for the vedi, which is the, um, the altar or railing molding at the top. So when you're working it out from the text, you do, you do the sums and Oh yes, it works, it, it works, it adds up to 19 and a half, and you know you've got it right. So the, the vidi, which forms the skandha or the shoulder, uh, that's subdivided to give a new bhaga, which gives us the uh, what they call in this text the ghanta, which is the the crowning member and its neck and its padma molding and its kalasha and its little finial. So compare that with actual examples. This is the Jamaleshvara temple at Jamali in Malwa. And actually you'll find that the plans of a number of temples in that region, and also a plan drawn on the rocks at, at Bojpur are actually very close, are actually following the same design as the Malay, uh, Malayavan temple given in, in the text. There's another drawing at Bojpur engraved on the rocks, which is the one you see in the middle here, which gives you half a beautiful line drawing of half a Rumija Shikara. No detail, just the skeleton, a beautiful um, a framework which is rather in the spirit of the text, giving a framework which then, which gives you the main uh, elements and the proportions, which then needs to be elaborated. If we compare that drawing with the, the uh, Malayavan text, I've doubled it up uh, and me measured it. The, the drawing on the right shows the, measure, the actual measurements on the left, in centimeters and the bhagas or modules that we deduce from those on the right. And we'll find that the, the plan again follows exactly what is there in the text. 10, redivide by 12, five for the shala, two for the karna, one and a half for the pratirata. And then the, the vertical dimensions are not the same, it's not 12, um, it's 22, but the same principle of taking off a quarter each time. And the interesting thing is here is that not that the, the, um, the drawing is the same as the text, 
but that we the, the text gives us um, important clues as to how to analyze the drawing. If we hadn't learned those principles from the text, we might look for golden sections or um, or some other kind of geometry in the drawing, and we might never find it. But having got the principle of sub redividing, subdividing, taking off a quarter, and all that kind of thing, we can figure out the principles of the drawing. And to end with, uh, I'll move on to a, an example of a star-shaped temple, the type called the Shachringa in, in this text. And once again, we start with a square divided by 10. And again, doesn't tell us every time, because by now we know the principle that the garbha is six and the walls are two. Then it subdivides the 10, this time into 19. We know that it's a star-shaped temple. The corner is two of those 19. And just as before, the shala in the middle is five. And we, we can work out that that gives us a 16 pointed, uh, sorry, it gives us a, it gives us a star shape like that, with, uh, which is the equivalent to um, set subterrata. If it had been a square one, it would be seven projections. And these are swiveled round. And we will find it has, all, it, it, it also has seven boomies as we move on to the elevation. Once again, the same, exactly the same principles and the, exactly the same proportions are following through from the earlier types. Two and a half for the base, four for the wall, three for the kuta and varandika, 12 of the original 10 for the shikara, which this time is subdivided into 27 and three quarters. And we do the sums and on the principle of the first one being five and then taking off a quarter each time, we get four and three quarters, four and a half, four and a quarter, four, three and three quarters, leaving one and a half for the Vedi. And this we can compare with an actual monument. It's one of the um, it's one of the types like the last one we saw, which is uh, full, of which we can we find a number of actual examples, including one of the most uh, perfect and beautiful of all Bhumija temples, the Udayeshvara Temple at Udayapur, built in around. 1060. The photo on the right is it's not a photo actually it's a it's a it's a um, photogrammetric uh, study a, a digital model done by my friend uh, Kailash Rao kind permission of the ASI so it's a it's a scan done with a drone and then reconstructed and the, the, pho the photographic information put on it. And the wonderful thing is with, uh, with these, uh, these, these kinds of digital models is you, that you have all the, all, the, all the dimensions, all the proportions are perfect. You can get a perfect elevation and a perfect roof plan. And you can, you can um, for example, compare those proportions with texts which is what I'm doing here. Now, before I look at the elevation, I'd like to tell you about a, a, a geometrical principle that emerges from chapter five, 65 of the Samarandana. The principle of parivartana, which means going around the circle. And it's a way of constructing 
a star-shaped plan. There's a certain clue which tells us that, shows us that all the different star-shaped plans in there relate to um, little circles going around the big circle which surrounds the plan, or one of the other related circles um, related to the original square. And we find that, that the subdivision of the 10 into another number is not an arbitrary one. For each of these star-shaped plans, the little circles going around the big circle are a whole number or an easily understandable fraction of the bhagas of that second subdivision. So taking this example, we, we had 10, we divided it into 19. And that 19 is not an accident because if you take three of those 19 bhagas, you'll find that the little circle of three goes 28 times into the big circle that surrounds the square with a very, very small degree of variance. My friend Paul Glossop did the, did the maths for all this and worked, worked up and, and showed that these, these were either slightly overlapping or tiny, tiny gap, but imperceptible if you, if you do it graphically. And we can test this out on the plan. You can, of course, do an accurate drawing uh, and test it out. But you might have thought that this star shaped work, as I once did, other people have thought that it was based on a, a star with 32 points. But no, it's not. It's based on 28 points with two of those points hidden in the Badra. So there isn't a point on the axis. It's shifted. Uh, so the two, two points are hidden in the Badra and you've got 28 little circles going around. 28, each one, three of the 19. So now if we go back to the elevation, it's not the same as in the text. It's much, as you, as you can see, the profile is much more slender and elegant than the one in the text. Um, we divide by 10, the 10 and the 19, that all works. Uh, but it, going to the elevation, we see the, the wall, the bottom wall, again, very uh, rather satisfactorily is 10, and then again divided by 19, which is quite neat. And gives it that gives us five eight three three, and then for the superstructure, knowing that this business of subdivision, we we look for how it might be done. We'll find that the whole height is thirty four twenty four for the um, the shikara, right up to the finial in this case. So rather so there is the same uh, system is used for the the, the crowning. Ghanta as the shikara itself. And fiddling around with the, the model, we find it works 38. If you subdivide the 24 into 38, you will get a diminishing boomies. In this case, not uh, taking off one quarter each time, but taking off three eighths of a bhaga each time. And that gives us a Actually, I think a more elegant uh, diminution as we move up the shikara. A, a couple of observations about that. The, 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 um, the digital model shows us one thing. I've drawn the center line there, and you see this perfect looking, looking temple is not quite vertical, just shifted slightly no less beautiful for all that. And the other thing is that these bhagas, which seem to work very well, go all the way up. But when you get to the very top, there's a little gold tip 
on top of the bija purika finial, which is outside the system of bhagas. Now, of course, these inaccuracies can 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 happen. Uh, you know, nothing nothing is perfect. Could it, is it just that you know either I got it wrong or or um, they, by the time they got up there, they didn't measure it exactly, which is perfectly normal. But I have a hypothesis that, that maybe that's deliberately outside the measure, beyond measure, because maybe it represents an akasha linga, an ethereal, uh, ethere uh, ethereal linga, which is immaterial, beyond form, and beyond the world of manifestation. Oh, well, that's just to say, if you want to know more about Auris, you can read about it in, uh, in that book published in 2015, Theory and Practice of Temple Architecture in Medieval India. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier that Mattia Salvini, who is a Sanskritist colleague, did the translations uh, that, I, that I've been using. And then, because you, it's not just a matter of translating literally, you have to work on it and work on the designs and adapt and and um, and, and then uh, refine the, the translations uh, in relation to that. And to end with, well, these are not um, Bhumija temples or not central Indian temples, not from Marwa. They are from Karnataka, Karnata Dravida temples with miniature temples in the walls. 11th, 11th and 12th centuries, similar date to the Samarangana. And why am I showing you those? I, it's because it's really to say that that whole area, the Deccan and northwards, all, the, all those central areas at that time are very interesting because of an awareness of different traditions, that, that a, a conscious awareness of different temple forms, um, north and south. And as we've just seen with the Bhumija, uh, and it's reflected in the text, a, a, a conscious combination of Nagra and Dravida. And th these are Karnata Dravida temples, which have Nagra details and miniature Nagara temples, Bhumija, Bhumija, Shekari, um, hybrids, and on the right over here, uh, a kind of Bhumija temple with a Dravida temple emerging at the center. And uh, well, the, this is really the, the, ver the very end. Uh, going back to the text, We've seen that um, there are different kinds of relationships between theory and practice in the text, uh, different logics of progression in the, in the sequences of types that are given uh, and uh, different degrees of, of detail. And we've seen that the, the text can reflect practice. It can also look ahead to untried possibilities. It can create designs which are never built, but which would create extraordinary things if they weren't built. And in this last example, I just want to show how uh, you can also have designs in text which probably are never intended to be built, but are there for their poetic beauty and their metaphysical content. And I think that is the case with this one from chapter 57, which is called the Push, Pushpaka temple, which means a flower, the flower temple. And the whole language in which it's described is full of blossoms and petals and, and, um, and fragrant imagery. And look at the plan there at the bottom. It, the text tells us to, to create eight karanas, so, so it's like a star, it's got eight corners and each of those corners is a star shaped shape and then it tells us to put petals, dalas, on the, the star and it tells us the garbha in the middle also has these petals 
And then having told us that, it, it gives us four, four Bhadras, which bury the, uh, the beautiful uh, star-shaped corners that we've already drawn. We think That's, that can't be right. Why do they tell us to do it? And then they hide it in these great big um, Bhadras coming out. And then it becomes clear because it says, now we have five flowers, one, two, three, four, five, not nine. Uh, and then it refers to the subtle karanas, which you realize that, and then you realize that the flowers are still there somewhere, but they're hidden, embedded, not yet emerged, not yet manifested, not, not yet manifested, and, but living in the world between formlessness and form. So I hope I've given you an, an idea of the, um, the, the, the range of uh, invention um, and design that we can find in a text. And uh, thank you very much. And should I stop the recording, sir? Uh, yeah, please, please do. Yeah.